Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Ariba Shabbi and we have been discussing English language teaching ELT. The module that we are covering is structures of English and in this module we covered phonology last time and today we will discuss morphology. So before we proceed further let us recapitulate of what we did in the last session. We discussed about phonology which is an important component of linguistics and it is an integral to language teaching and learning. Besides the aim of phonology is to discover the principles that govern the way sounds are organized in a language and we also understood the variations that occurred uh, during uh, the uh, understanding of phonology. We talked about International Phonetic Alphabet and International Phonetic Association which is needed to understand the sound system of English language. We can decode any language when it comes uh, to uh, International Phonetic uh, Association. Uh, we also uh, understood that if there is a difficulty in uh, understanding uh, phonemes then we are likely to produce wrong sounds. So, in order to make it correct, it is important to understand phonology and practice it widely so that we become master of it and ex develop expertise. In addition, we talked about vowels and consonants which are important to phonetics and in vowels we understood that how mouth is fairly open when you speak up a sound. Similarly, we also discussed about cons consonants which are produced with reconstructions. Uh, we also discussed uh, the description and uh, we identified manner of articulation and place of articulation with respect to uh, the sounds of English language. Moving on to the learning outcome, after this session you will be able to understand morphology, morpheme, inflection and derivation in the second language context that is English in India. In addition, you will be able to develop the conceptual framework of word formation which includes affix, coinage, borrowing, reduplication, blending, etc. In addition, you will be able to apply general understanding of morphology and help the learners understand second language uh, in the uh, Indian context. Now uh, let us proceed towards uh, the important component of language. So dear learners, when we talk about the components of language uh, learning, we cannot forget that our utterances are being generally divided into two main things. What are those? These are sounds and the second thing is meaning or you can say the content. So uh, what does sound represent or what does a spoken part represent that is the uh, point to mention here and what meaning does in a context that is also important to uh, analyze here. So whenever we talk about sounds it means we generally refer to the medium of information which is being transferred from the sender to the receiver. So we can say over here that sounds represent the expression. In the same way, we can say that the meaning represents the content or you can say the idea that we would like to transfer it to the audience, to the viewer. Right. Now, one more important thing is that when we divide this, you know, the expression and sound part. So, when we talk about sounds, we cannot uh, forget that uh, we studied consonants and we also talked about vowels. 
right. So, how consonants and vowels are organized? They are organized in a definite uh, system which are called syllables, right. So, uh, a syllable is a unit which incorporates consonant, which incorporates a vowel and it is said that if you have to identify a syllable or you have to identify syllables into in a word then count the number of vowels. The reason behind this is that the number of vowels is equal to the number of syllables. For example, if we say uh, color, think of this word and try to find out the number of vowels. Now dear learners, please make sure that you are not counting the number of letters, rather you are counting the number of sounds, vowel sounds. So, when you look up at uh, this particular part which I am uh, putting it on the board, so you will see that it is this part which is k and the other part is l and you pronounce color, color. So, in this way there are two sounds and if you say that there are two sounds, it means you are talking about the two syllables that comes as k, a and then l and then a, which is the phonetic representation of the word, fine. Now uh, as you know that uh, when we talk about consonants and vowels, we cannot forget that vowels are not just the five vowels, rather they are the letters, but we need to mention that there are 44, 44 sounds consisting of 20 consonant, uh, 24 consonants and 20 vowels. So, when it comes to uh, the uh, articulation, we say that there are two units of articulation. Can you name those uh, two units? These are phoneme and morpheme. Now, uh, as you know that phoneme are 44 in number, right? And morpheme are those units which make relationship with the context of language. And they are typically composed of several phonemes. So, phonemes are not meaningful, but when they are combined and put together, then you can say that it is composing a morpheme and therefore, they come out as a unit, as a separate entity. Um, they are typically composed of several phonemes and uh, to give you, uh, to, to make it more, uh, to make it simpler to you, uh, you may encounter a language uh, where you hear sounds and you feel that these sounds are unintelligible to you or you cannot hear those when you hear those sounds, you do not find the meaning of it, right. But when it comes to the native speaker of that language, that person would find meaning and would be able to relate it with the context. So, the same language and the same cluster of sounds that you find not comprehensible is meaningful for the person who comes from the same language who has uh, seen, the, who has observed that language in his or her daily life. Now, uh, scientifically if we say then uh, we have two components as I just discussed, first is expression and the second is content and uh, as linguists say speech is an orderly sequence of specific kinds of sounds or of the sequence of sounds. Let us make out what morpheme is. So, dear learners, morphemes are generally short sequences of phonemes and they may or may not be grammatical. Let me tell you that uh, some of the linguists argue that they are uh, uh, they are the smallest meaningful unit. Some may play um, grammatical function, 
So, let us take the example of go. Now, what happens in go? You can use this word as it is and you cannot further divide it. Why? Because if you decompose it, then you will find that the entities are not going to be meaningful. So, uh, if you can add it, add something over here, you can do it in lot of ways. For example, you can say going, right. So, how does this going work? You can further decompose it and make it go plus ing. So, here you are uh, fragmenting it into two parts and what are those two parts or I can say you are decomposing it into two forms. First is the go and the second is ing. Now, my question to you is what is ing? Actually, ing is the uh, progressive marker. It tells that you are in the present tense and it is being in continuation. So, it is the tense marker and you are uh, connecting it with the root that is go and you are making it going. Fine. Similarly, I can take up other examples also which are important for you to understand. These are I want to go home. I am writing on board. I want to go home or I want to go. Let us take up only this uh, fragment. So, you will see that there are several words. I is there, want is there, similarly to is there and go is also there. Can you think of the arrangement or can you think of the expressions that are independent that does not require any other any support to get it fixed. For example, you say I which is independent, I mean you can express it uh, in the in the form of your experience, right. Similarly, want is also an independent, right. You can think of go which is also an independent, but what is the point of putting two over here? What I am trying to tell you here is that you may have I want and go in separation, but when you put up all these words in one frame or you say in one sentence, then you will not find connectivity. Why? Because these are contained words. You need to put up a word which has to play a grammatical function. So, which word can play a grammatical function here? The answer to this question is that two is actually playing a grammatical function. And after you insert two in the line, you will see that your sentence become complete and it conveys a meaning. Another important thing to note over here is that two is a word which plays a grammatical function but it cannot do anything in a context, uh, it, it cannot do anything in isolation. If it is put separately, it cannot function, it cannot work, it needs a support of uh, words that are independent, that, uh, that, that are put together. Therefore, you can say that I want and go come from the aspects of human experience and two plays a grammatical function without uh, two uh, the rest of the words are not in a line or would not produce a coherence. Now, I will talk about another important thing over here is let us take up the example of a word cat. Okay. Uh, when you talk about cat, it means uh, you, you are referring to an entity, okay. And if I ask you to use cat in different, different situations, you may or may not be able. It is not necessary that cat would fit in every situation. If you are really confused of it, let me clear it. The first sentence that I will take up as an example is, I saw I saw a and there is a blank. Now, my question to you is, 
can you fill up this blank with the word cat? I am sure you would have an answer to say and you will put up saying that yes we can, you can write I saw a cat. But my next uh, situation is slightly different. I will write I will blank market. If I ask you to fill up this blank with the word cat, will you be able to do so? Let us try. I am putting word cat over here. So, would you be able to say that I will cat market? No. Why? Because this is not going with the context. This is not going with the situation which is being given or mentioned in the line. But the concept of morpheme and the characteristics that I have been trying to put up over here is that there is a contrastive difference between those words which can fit in a context and which may not. There is a sharp differentiation between. Uh, since we have largely discussed phonology, uh, we are now discussing morphology. So, they are found in conjunction. How? Let me tell you that the linguists who have been working on phonology and those who are working on morphology, they have tried to look up the concepts through the lens of, uh, through the lens of sociology through the lens of anthropology. Now, uh, since we talk about phoneme and its conjunction or you can say its relation with a morpheme, we have to understand that phoneme carries no meaning in isolation. However, when these phonemes are put uh, together and they are found uh, up, uh, they are clustered together, then they create morpheme, therefore they become meaningful. To make it more comprehensible to you, let us understand and take up another word that is singing. So, uh, how would you say that singing consists of uh, phonemes and morphemes. So, you will say the phonemes are these, s, e and then there is a sound of a uh, and then there is a sound, then there are, then so on. But if I ask you ki when, when I ask you to put all these phonemes together, you will come up uh, creating a meaningful morpheme that is sing. And similarly, you will create another one which is ing. Therefore, you make it singing. Another important thing which we should understand here is uh, there is there is something which we call stem. Now, what is a stem? Stem is a morpheme in which other uh, things can be added. So, what are those other things? They are suffix and they are prefix. So, basically I can say that affix can be added to step, step. So, if I look up at this word again, I would say that in the word singing, you have added suffix to the word to the morpheme sing. So, here sing would appear as stem and ing would appear as suffix. Similarly, we can take up other examples also. The other examples such as you say uh, words. So, here word would work as stem and s would be would be a plural would be a plural marker. Fine. Other examples that we can take up over here and I think they are important to learn and uh, these examples can help you to practice uh, are friend or you can say, okay, the, the, uh, let us write friend. Can you think of the suffixes or prefixes that you can add 
in the system? I am sure you would have lot of answers saying that yes, we can add ly, right? You can also add uh, ship to make it friendship, right? And you can add prefix while making it unfriendly. So, can you think of the stem which has so many of intakes? These intakes are ly, these intakes are ship, these intakes include un as well. So, prefix and suffixes are being included and therefore, the stem is being found. If there are two stems, then we uh, then we say that uh, the word is basically a compound. So, can you think of a word which has two stems? The answer to this question uh, is uh, black bird. Now, tell me what happens in black bird? There are two stems black and bird. So, they are no more separate words rather they are one and therefore, you say that they are compound. Since you have developed uh, a very basic understanding of uh, phoneme, of uh, morpheme, now let us go through the definitions that have been put across and try to find out what morphology is in the academics. So, as far as linguistics is concerned, uh, Merriam Webster's dictionary defined morphology as a study of the internal construction of words. And according to Mark Harnoff and Kristen Fuderman, linguistics says that morphology refers to the mental system involved in word formation or to the branch it deals with words, their internal structure and how they are formed. And according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, morpheme in linguistics is the smallest grammatical unit of a speech. However, there is one more concept that is known as uh, allomorphs, and allomorphs are the variants of the same morpheme. So, in these definitions, it is pretty clear that morphology talks about the internal construction of words. It is, it talks about that how a word is formed and how we can deal with their internal structures and how they are being put when it comes to the adoption. Right, now uh, let us understand these things in a very systematic way. Uh, when we talk about word or uh, words, I am taking the words itself as an example. So, you will see that words is being classified into word and s is being classified, uh, it is being put as a separate grammatical entity. Right. Now, think of the dependency and the independent uh, morpheme. You will see that word is an independent morpheme. How? Because it does not require any support to complete it. It can function in isolation as well. If you speak up the word word, then it is no more unintelligible to you, rather it is comprehensible and you can make out its meaning. But when you say S, it cannot work alone. It needs to have a company. So, what about its company? You can say that if a morpheme is dependent, it needs support or you can say it needs a company to fulfill its function, then it is a bound morpheme. On the contrary, if you find that a morpheme is independent and it does not require any support or any help to complete it, if it is put with a grammatical, uh, a grammatical morpheme, then uh, its, uh, its meaning gets uh, extended, then you will realize that this particular word or uh, uh, this particular entity is known as free morpheme. To help you understand 
more clearly, I will take up another example which is quite complex, but it is easy to understand. Let us say walked or let us say replacement. Now, in the word walked, what do you see? Do you see a free morpheme and a bound morpheme? If yes, then can you name those or can you isolate those? So, I will first mark over here that walk is a free morpheme because it can be put up in isolation. It carries meaning even in separation, but when it comes to ed, it does not. Therefore, ed to us becomes uh, a bound morpheme. In the same way, we will try to find out the construction of replacement. What happens in replacement that you are finding up so many words or you can say so many in the same word you find so many uh, morphemes. These are re, you find place and you find meant as well. Now think of re, can you put re in isolation? No. Can you put place in isolation? Yes, because it is carrying a separate meaning. Similarly, can you put meant in isolation? Then the answer to this question is no. It needs a support, it needs a word, it needs a morpheme to make it functional. So, when we talk about morphology and we try to look up at the construction of words, we need to understand two important concepts that help us understand and the real uh, in realizing morphemes. So, these are inflection and derivation as you can see in the slide. Now, the question here is what is inflection, what is derivation and how it is going to help us understand the formation of words, then I would first say that look up at the word inflection and try to understand it uh, with the help of examples. In inflection, I'll, uh, in order to explain you the concept of inflection, I will again take up the example of cat. Okay. So, this cat refers to one cat. It means there is only one cat in number. However, if I refer to more than one cat, okay, if I refer to these, if I refer to this animal which is more than one in number, then I will use S marker, which is also known as plural marker. So, instead of writing cat, I will write cats. Uh, if I have to give you another example of inflection, I would use the word dish. Now, what happens in dish? If there is one dish, you will say dish. But if you put a plural marker, you will put es with it. So, this means that not the one in number, but more than one. Therefore, I will complete it by writing dishes. So, what does inflection do? Inflection brings the grammatical function in the morpheme, right? It makes the word grammatical and it helps in, uh, in, 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 in uh, 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 bringing grammatical change in the word, okay? And since I am talking about S and the plural mark is markers which are happening, let me tell you that in the last slide we talked about the definition of allomorphs. So, in allomorphs we talk about uh, the variants of the same morpheme. I would say that both S and ES signify the plural markers. They are used to indicate that uh, these uh, particular things are not in one number, but more than uh, in numbers. So, it means that S and ES are plural markers and therefore, they are the variants of the same morpheme. So, S and ES are the same 
um, plural are the plural markers of uh, are the plural markers but are uh, uh, but are the variants of the same uh, meaning therefore you can say that they are allomorphs now when you talk about derivation then it is slightly different but very interesting how derivation works that there are some changes that take place and what are those changes let me tell you that some words are bound to change uh, their function they are bound to change uh, their meaning as well so in order to give you examples i'll first take up the word com compete think of this word compete what is happening over here which, which part of a speech do you find over here compete compete is actually a verb here right uh, you can change this word uh, by adding i o n when i write compete and add i o n it will become competition so it is no more verb rather it becomes a noun competition is something which he seriously takes so what is happening here competition is placed as noun right similarly you can put ive right in order to change it further you will see that compete while including with iv becomes competit competitive okay it means it is no more a verb and also not noun but becomes adjective you can further add ly now after adding ly you will find that it becomes competitively so do you think that it is a verb or noun or adjective no it has taken another form and what's that form it is adverb so you see that a noun changes to verb verb changes to adjective adjective has changed to adverb and so on so when there is a change in the word and its form then you realize that this is the process of derivation this is the derivation that we have been discussing so one thing which is pretty clear here is that derivation refers to the uh, change uh, in word class that is noun gets changed into verb word a verb into adjective and adverb and so on and one more thing which many linguists have tried to put up is that uh, when the meaning gets changed that then also derivation takes place so how meaning gets changed that we will try to look up in the slide how derivation takes uh, place that we will try to understand through the same example compete right so when you talk about compete or uh, when you talk about uh, competitive let's say i'll add ive compete let's talk about uh, competition when we insert ive as a suffix we will realize that its meaning can get changed if we add prefix with it so in the word com compete you add iv and in the prefix you can add super also so it will become super competitive therefore you realize that the meaning gets changed or you can say that the meaning gets expanded there is an expansion that has been taking place right similarly you can say super competitively or super competitive so these uh, changes that have been taking place in the formation of words refer to the process 
of derivation. So one thing which can be concluded over here is that inflection brings the grammatical change and derivation uh, changes uh, the uh, changes uh, the word class and the second thing uh, that it changes the original meaning. Interestingly, if I give you uh, a similar example to help you understand that how inflection and derivation work together. So, I will use competing. Now, tell me is competing uh, a process of inflection or derivation? Now, think of this word and uh, try to understand that is it a process of inflection or derivation. So, first thing that will come automatically to you is that compete uh, includes ing, it means it is it is uh, taking up uh, a grammatical function with it right and therefore, uh, it is a process of inflection. But if I say that it is also a part of derivation then you will be amazed to know that competing can be used as noun and it can be used as verb in the way that it brings change in the word class. How? We can understand it with the help of an example. Um, if I say competing is something which he takes seriously. So, here competing is no more a verb, here competing is actually a noun. But if I uh, change this sentence and say it in a way that uh, she has been competing in the competition, then what will happen? The, com the competing will become a verb. So, at one place the same word is used as noun and the other place uh, the same word is used as verb. Therefore, you can say that not just inflection is happening, but derivation is also taking place. To make you more clear, uh, to make you, uh, to make you uh, develop the understanding of inflection and derivation, let us quickly do this activity and find out uh, this words in the sentences that whether they are inflection or they are the process of derivation. I work with the president of Alpha Chem. Think of this word and see that worked is uh, the word that we can encounter here. So, worked is the process of inflection. Okay. How? Because it composed of it, it is composed of work plus ed. Okay. Work is the morpheme and it is a free morpheme. However, ed is a, a tense marker. Therefore, ed is required to get itself combined with work to make to, to make it worked. Therefore, it is the process of inflection because there is a grammatical change that is happening. Now, in the next sentence, if you see that it is written over here, Ravi is an environmentalist. Okay. Ravi is an environmentalist, what is root in this sentence? Environment, okay. if environment is the root, then what is al here? By including al with the root environment, you are making this word as adjective, but when you add ist, you are making it as noun. Right. So, uh, uh, what is happening over here? You can say that uh, it is the process of derivation. 
because at one place the adjective is there then you find that the, it is being changed into noun. So, the word class is changing right. Uh, in the next example uh, it is written your efforts are unbelievable. Now, uh, the word unbelievable your efforts are unbelievable. Now, in this word unbelievable you see that it is composed of un and it is also composed of believe plus there is a suffix which is ble right. Now, think that how unbelievable is working. Firstly, it is uh, being added with suffix therefore, it is playing the role of uh, inflection uh, and it is it is the process of inflection, but when un is added. So, there you find a change in the meaning. So, believable becomes unbelievable which is entirely opposite of the meaning which this word drives off. Therefore, you can say that it is the process of derivation. Similarly, you can take up the other example uh, where it is written that Ravi has taken his brother's phone. Now, in the word brothers, what do you see? It is uh, it is brothers, it is the apostrophe s. So, this s is actually playing a grammatical part and there is no change in the meaning. Also, there is no change in the word class. Therefore, you can easily say that it is the example of inflection. Another sentence that is mentioned over here is Satya goes to college. Now, look up at uh, the word goes. What is happening over here? Here go is the root and it is combined with the grammatical entity that is es. So, it is nowhere changing the word class and it is also not bringing the change in the meaning. Go and the goes uh, are in conjunction they are the basically s and es are the allomorphs of the same morpheme. So, the morpheme which is being indicated here is this uh, the, the, the same. So, you can say that it is again the example of inflection. So, um, in the process of understanding morphology let us try to look up at uh, word formation. So, what is word formation? It is the uh, it, it is the creation of new word and it refers to the ways, uh, ways in which new words are formed in which new words are constructed. So, the first one as you can see is affix, affix refers to prefix and they also refer to suffix. Okay. So, what happens in prefix that you put a morpheme before the root word and uh, what happens in suffix that you put a morpheme after the root. So, if you take up the example of uh, lingual you can put up a prefix mono and the meaning becomes monoling uh, and the word becomes monolingual. Okay. Similarly, you can put up a, a suffix like a b l e and make it uh, uh, may and come up with different uh, words such as preventable. Such as preventable, adaptable, criminal, seasonal. So, you find that not just prefix, but suffix also play important role in the formation of words. So, if I have to particularly go to prefix and suffixes, I will again put up into several parts like prefix talk about like prefix, there are prefix which are found in negation, there are prefix which are which indicate uh, uh, a number. Okay. There are prefixes which uh, uh, emphasize the root word. So, you can say in uh, prefix of emphasizing 
or emphasizing degree you find suffixes those uh, are adjective suffixes verb suffixes adverb suffixes so if you quickly take up the example of the number of affixes you will realize that uni by di and uh, uh, cot these are the morphemes which are uh, which are being added in a root word to indicate a different meaning right then there is a word then there is a neg then there are a negative uh, uh, negative prefixes or you can say prefix of negation so what happens in negation you put words you put morphemes like un non and you say unconventional or you say uh, uh, you say uh, non academic these are the words that indicate that prefix are added as negation and then you have emphasizing as well which expands the meaning of a word like you can say man and then if you put emphasizing prefix you will say a uh, super so the word would become superman what happens in uh, suffixes suffixes comes uh, suffixes come in the form of adjective verb like in adjective we have able and able uh, or you can say ible right you can make uh, uh, predictable credible and with ible you can or uh, make uh, with able you can make uh, preventable with ible you can make credible uh, similarly you can make full you you can incorporate morpheme with full and make notable uh, 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 words like grateful beautiful wonderful fanciful similarly you have verb and adverbs that indicate the insertion of ed ing and as far as adverbs are concerned you can talk about lee you can talk about wise as well so uh, if i ask you to give up example of wise you'll say clockwise right edge wise length wise so after understanding what uh, affixes are and how prefix and suffix contribute in the formation of words let's look up at to conversion so after understanding the idea of affix let's look up at uh, conversion what happens in conversion as you can see in the slide conversion involves a change of a word from one word one class to another for example you can use a uh, word text in different forms you can use text in different forms like uh, you say can you text her so the here text is used as a verb so here is the text in this uh, utterance you find that text is used as noun so conversion is basically uh, uh, conversion basically refers to the change in the word class coming up to the compounding compounding refers to the link uh, that uh, brings two or more bases to create a new word for example you say back and you say ache and then join those two bases find you'll find that back ache becomes a word similarly you can say water bottle you can say wrist watch and so on a uh, compound words are not just that uh, the two bases are alike or they are same in function or they are same in form rather they one can be noun and the other can be verb uh, one can be adjective and the other can be noun similarly adjective can infuse with verb preposition can infuse with a uh, verb let's take up quick examples for instance adjective two adjectives break um, come together and uh, uh, work as compound let's say sugar and then there is another adjective that is free so sugar and free becomes one and therefore compound is formed you can say bitter sweet so bitter is one sweet is the other and bitter and sweet becomes one compound right blueberry these are the examples of uh, adjective and noun so blue is the mod, uh, is the modifier to the noun which is berry so blue berry in the same way you can uh, form a verb noun compound 
uh, like you say work room or you can say pick pocket similarly you can uh, bring adjective and verb together forming highlight or say whitewash uh, let's take up reduplication as the process of word formation reduplication is interesting how we usually use it in our real life situation and we are in a habit of reduplicating so how do we reduplicate by uh, by by three in uh, we reduplicate in three ways first we change the first consonant sound or the last consonant sound we also tend to change the vowel sound and in some cases we do not change uh, the consonant or vowel sounds we repeat words exactly let's say how it works if you say walkie talkie i'm writing on board walkie talkie both the articulation of both uh, the words are same both the morphemes are same but here the difference is of the first consonant in the letter you see that t is used instead of w and therefore it is the example of reduplication similarly if i have to ask you uh, if i have to ask you an example where vowel gets changed you may come up with words like chit chat so what happens in chit chat you find consonants are not changed rather vowels change so in the chit e sound is there e and then chat uh, a sound is there so therefore you can say that in the process of reduplication vowels also change sometimes in reduplication neither consonant nor vowel change rather uh, it is repeated uh, ex, uh, in the same way like you say bye bye i'm writing here bye 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 so do you see any change with respect to consonant or vowel no the exact word is repeated similarly you can uh, think of words like win win so so and so on in uh, the process of initialism we take the first letter of uh, of every word and put put it all together we take uh, the first letters of word and put these letters all together for example you say uh, computer based instruction and while writing computer based instruction you gather the first letter of each word and you present it in uh, and you present it as cbi right similarly you can say central board of investigation so central the c for central b for uh, a board i for investigation uh, these are the first letters of each word you can also think of html you can also think of dvd so the, the first letters are put all together and they are uh, being presented so this uh, so initialism uh, incorporates such examples it is important to distinguish between initialism and acronym because initialism uh, talks about the first letter of the each word whether it goes with the rhythm or not but in acronym we adopt and we take out the first letters of every word in such a way that they themselves become a word for example you say nato right the north atlantic treaty organization so you have taken nor n from north atla a from atlantic t uh, t from treaty and o from organization and you are putting up these letters in such a way that they sound as an individual word fine now uh, you can think of unicef the united nation children's fund you don't say u n i c e f rather you say unicef so you are pronouncing as if they as if it is a complete word as it has it has its own meaning similarly you can take up other examples also um there is one more concept which is very much close to initialism and acronym and this is abbreviation so abbreviation refers to the shortening of words what uh, abbreviation do that uh, you write full word but sometimes 
you cut this word and bring a very shorter uh, presentation. So, you sometimes present it as a double c and dot. So, this is the abbreviation. Similarly, instead of saying captain, you say C A P T and you put it, uh, uh, you uh, put the you know shorter one. Instead of writing doctor, you write D R and so on. Uh, in coinage, you uh, invent a totally new term after anything that become famous, right? You say uh, Xerox for photocopy. You say Google for search engine. Okay. You say Fevicol for glue. Although you are not referring to a particular company, or you are not uh, uh, targeting a particular brand, but that uh, brand becomes or that uh, uh, entity becomes so famous that uh, that everything which is coming to your mind with that particular. Uh, 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 meaning you will relate it. So, you will not say that I need to go for photocopy nowadays you say it is Xerox. However, Xerox is not a photocopy it is a name of a brand. Uh, similarly, you find that, that there is another word formation process and that is referred to as uh, back formation. In back formation what happens that you shorten a long word by cutting off an affix to form a new word. For example, uh, you say uh, auto destruct instead of saying auto destruction. You say air condition instead of saying air conditioning. Similarly, you say choreograph instead of saying choreography. right? So, you cut short uh, in order to make it a very different and a new word. And the another uh, a process of word formation is blending which is an interesting one and uh, it refers to the combination of two words and when those two words are combined they are no more uh, uh, resembling in, they, they are no more in their own original form they uh, come up with a new uh, uh, coinage. So, in blending what happens that it is totally accomplished by com, uh, combining the two initial part of one word and the last part of another word. For example, you, you, you nowadays you use brunch which is the combination of breakfast and lunch. So, you are taking the first uh, two words of the word breakfast and the last two letters of lunch and making it brunch. Okay. Similarly, you uh, use emoticon. So, how come emoticon? It is actually a process of blending. It is, uh, it comes from emotion plus icon. Similarly, you say smog, so, uh, fog plus uh, smoke and you combine the initial and the last two letters of these words and form a very different word that is blending. Now, the last one is clipping. Clipping is the word formation process which consists in the reduction of a word to one of its parts. So, for example, you say advertisement, but nowadays or the example of clipping is that you make it to add instead of advertisement. You do not say refrigerator rather you clip it and make it fridge. Similarly, instead of saying influenza you cut it and say it is flu. So, this is the example of clipping. So, after uh, realizing the process of word formation and understanding uh, morphology, morpheme, uh, allomorphs in detail, we can say that language is not merely uh, the matter of expression, but it is also a matter of content. Similarly, we can say that morphology is an important component of linguistics. If we have a sound understanding and knowledge of uh, morphology, we will be able to understand language uh, in a better way and it will help us to learn uh, efficiently. 
The other thing that we have gone through in this session is that the aim of morphology is to discover and uncover the fundamentals and the principles that have been taking place in the language teaching and learning. Uh, one more important point to mention over here is that it is useful to divide the morphological constructions of complex words into two kinds inflection and derivation and this helps us to, uh, uh, to go through more uh, deeply. Word formation is the creation of a new word it comes through blending, it comes through clipping, it can uh, appear uh, um, as coinage, acronym, initialism and so on. So, so far we have uh, gone through the idea of morphology. In the next session we will discuss syntax. These are the references. Thank you very much for joining this session.